And welcome back to the Zodcast. That was, of course, Don Cheney bringing up the book by Agatha Christie called The ABC Murders. And like I said, it's always under the guise of Arthur Lee Allen, of course. But uh, he knew about this book and he's admitting it. And he's even admitting that Arthur Lee Allen never even mentioned the name of the book being The ABC Murders by Agatha Christie. So this is part two. And some more parallels uh, are going to be mentioned between this book and the Zodiac Killer Crimes. So just to kind of recap on the last episode, we talked about uh, ABC murders and the, just some generalities between that and the Zodiac Killer Crimes. Of course, uh, the ABC murders is a work of fiction by Agatha Christie, and it's set in 1936 or the 1930s. And the book was written in, I think, 1936, so it was... Uh, current to the time it was written but uh, the basics are that it is talking about a serial killer which you know that term didn't exist then but it was a spree killer as they called it a guy that committed multiple murders and he's calling himself the abc murderer and he calls himself because he uh, when he chooses his victims the first victim's name started with an a and the second with a b and, and then a c on the third crime and then uh, the fourth was a D, and another. that's another interesting parallel that uh, there were four crimes in the Agatha Christie book, The ABC Murders, and there was four canonical crimes, as we call them, and the Zodiac Killings. Of course, in the Agatha Christie book, they aren't, uh, they're not couples. None of them are couples. It was all single individuals, so that's one uh, uh, discrepancy between the book and the actual Zodiac crimes, but it makes a really good framework, and to get into it a little deeper, we have a... Uh, the the lead suspect, or actually the guy that we find out is the ABC murderer, is a guy that goes by the name Franklin Clark. So, uh, spoiler alert, if, you, if you're wanting to read the book, I'm giving that away. The murderer turns out to be a guy named Franklin Clark. And really interestingly about that, uh, Franklin Clark, before he's discovered as being the ABC murderer, actually offers help. He ins inserts himself into the case uh, by saying that the family members of the murder victims to get, should get together and try to figure out uh, who the killer is. So he does insert himself into the case, a la Don Cheney, uh, more, than, more so than even Arthur Lee Allen. Uh, Don Cheney inserts himself in the case trying to give him the, you know, try to give them the name of the person that's going to solve it. Arthur Lee Allen never did that. Uh, he offered to help, but he never really did anything but... Uh, keep the police running in circles so going back to the abc murderers like i said the killer turns out to be this guy named franklin clark and what franklin clark wants to do is basically uh or what he did do was kill his brother a guy named carmichael clark and he was worried about that because uh carmichael clark's current wife uh, was sickly and she he was afraid she was going to die and then his brother Carmichael was going to get together with the secretary or something at the office who kind of may have had her eye on him and and uh, his brother Carmichael Clark's very wealthy guy in society so he's you know it's basically a money thing he's worried that uh, if his uh, his brother's wife dies that he's going to hook up with this this younger lady and she's going to take all his money and he's not going to get any you know that's it kind of in a nutshell so it is motivated by money and when Don Cheney brings this up, he's talking about a contract kill. Well, the reason Cheney mentions contract kill is because of Ralph Spinelli, of course, and Ralph Spinelli's story about 
Arthur Lee Allen coming to him saying, uh, hey, I can do hits for you and I'll show you. And then he, uh, Paul Stein gets murdered. Then he comes back and tells Ralph Spinelli, hey, do you believe me now? And Spinelli says, yeah, I believe you. Now get the hell out of here. So that's the reason why Cheney's equating that and using the word contract kill because he's still trying to shade enough of this over to Arthur Lee Allen. What is... Uh, apparent in the book as there was a targeted murder and that being uh Clark's brother because obviously like I just said Clark wants to take out his brother because he's worried that the brother's wife's going to die and this younger lady's going to get with him and he's going to eventually lose his money so it was a targeted murder placed in between random murders not a contract per se because no money was exchanged to go do the murder of course but the brother's the one he wants to remove and he's doing these other three murders in addition to it to kind of throw the police off. So important things to notice here is it there's there it's a set of murders. It's four murders. The guy's names himself ABC, which is what he wrote on the taunting letters that were uh, sent in, you know, in this book, the ABC murders by Arthur Christie were sent from uh, Franklin Clark to the ex detective named Poirot. So Poirot is getting these letters from the killer because the killer thinks this guy's smart and I'm going to try to mess with him and give him plenty of clues to try to come catch me to see if he can do it. So it's an intellectual deal by this killer to see if he can outsmart them. Sounds a lot like Zodiac, doesn't it? And I want to read one of these uh, one of these taunting letters that was sent to Poirot by uh, Franklin Clark in the book. And let you tell me if this sounds a little bit like what the Zodiac's going to do many years later after this book is written. And just to set the scene, here is a uh, screenshot of an actor playing the role of Franklin Clark, who was, of course, the ABC murderer from one of the, uh, I think this was one of the ones that was made for TV, uh, where John Malkovich was starring in the role of Perot. And the taunting letter reads, Poor Mr. Perot, not so good at these little criminal matters as you thought yourself, are you? Rather past your prime, perhaps. Let us see if you can do any better this time. This time, it's an easy one. Churston on the 30th. Do try and do something about it. It's a bit dull having it all my own way, you know. Good hunting. Ever yours, ABC. So you just see a lot of that. Of course, he has a hunting reference in there. Of course, Zodiac mentions hunting and the 408 cipher. But you see the tauntingness of it, and that just wasn't common. Uh, there was never no, any known serial killer up to uh, the Zodiac that was known for sending taunting letters to either the detective or to the media, for that matter, the police or the uh, newspapers at the time. So it's just another thing to consider. Here you got a guy writing taunting letters to what you know we call a law enforcement figure as a detective, and this same person who turns to you know turns out to be the murderer uh, is also inserting himself into the case before it's solved and offering uh, for the fam to get the families together and try to figure out you know, who murdered their family members. And so he's inserting himself. There's just a lot of parallels here. Another parallel I had mentioned between the book, the ABC murders and the Zodiac killer case is in the book, the ABC murders. There is a character named Elizabeth Bernard. She goes by the uh, nickname Betty and she is the second victim of the ABC murderer. And, of course, uh, we have Darlene Farron, which went by the name D for short. And she was the Zodiac Killer's third victim because, um, obviously, the first two were Betty Lou Jensen. There's Betty again, of course, and then uh, David Arthur Faraday. And then Darlene Farron being the third person to, uh, to be murdered by the Zodiac Killer. So in the ABC Murders book, the character, Betty Bernard, is a waitress at a breakfast-type restaurant and um, obviously so is Darlene Farron, who at the time of the Zodiac crimes worked at a place called Terry's Waffle House. And it was well known that when Darlene Farron worked at Terry's Waffle House, she was very flirtatious. She was considered a flirty waitress, very nice to customers, and uh, she dated a lot, although she was married. And this is really in uh, perfect parallel to the character from the ABC Murders book. But what's more interesting in the book the abc murders it uh, states a time of approximate death of betty bernard the victim and it's sometime between midnight and 1 a.m and as we know that the uh, time of death of darlene farron was 12 38 a.m as she arrived to the hospital after the blue rock spring shooting so that's a stunning tie in there now i don't know if the if Darlene Farron was the Zodiac Killer's prime target or if that was a contract, that probably was not a contract. But if it was the 
let's just say it was the, the, the murder that, that the Zodiac wanted to commit and did the others just to uh, camouflage it as they do in the book, The ABC Murders. Um, it is interesting that Betty Bernard from the ABC Murders book and Darlene Farron from the Zodiac Killer Crimes were both killed in the same hour. And one of the clues that the ABC murderer always left behind after he killed someone in that uh, novel was he would leave a ABC railway guide. And that would be one of the you know definite clues that uh, he was the one that actually did the murder. So it's kind of, uh, I guess, kind of rel- reminiscent to uh, the Zodiac Killer cutting off a piece of Paul Stein's shirt and then mailing it in. But, every, you know, they, but they would actually find this. Uh, piece at the crime scene so it was kind of his signature to leave a copy of the abc Rail, uh, railway guide at each of his murders so uh how that would tie in exactly with zodiac or not i don't know but it's just something worth mentioning for sure in this book so now as promised i want to answer this question that was left in the uh, comment section by mark gunn and he says drew if it turns out that cheney and allen were the zodiac and they did base the Zodiac murders on the ABC murder theory, that would mean that one of the four attacks was a targeted planned attack, and the other three were just random murders to disguise the main one. So what would so what one would be the planned attack and what ones would be the random murders? Well as I just mentioned, I you know, I don't obviously I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did. Uh but I'm thinking that one of them, if it was the planned attack, could have been Darling Farron. I don't know if that would have been, you know, I don't even think that would be more like a jealous husband and Dean Farron or uh, uh, James Phillips Crabtree. Of course, that was Darlene Farron's husband before Dean Farron. But I'm thinking if it was Darlene Farron, it's because of something she knew. I mean, she dated officers. I think Buzz Gordon was rumored to have been dating her. Uh, so it would have been more like something she knew other than like a jealous boyfriend or husband, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not saying she was. I'm just saying I think she's the most likely if that was the case where, you know, there was a targeted murder like the ABC, I think it would have been Darlene Farron. And here's the second part of uh, Mark's question. It says the cab driver murder stands out by a mile. So that might be the targeted attack and the attacks on couples might be the random murders. But why would they plan to attack a cabbie? Question mark. Would it have something to do with Lee wanting to become a professional criminal and prove himself to the mob? Question mark. I'm sure Don said something like this in the documentary. Maybe Ralph Spinelli was telling the truth? Question mark. Or it might just be that Don and Lee liked playing with the police and had nothing to do with the Z since DNA, fingerprints, and handwriting samples came back negative for both guys. So starting with Paul Stein, could he have been the uh, targeted murderer? Uh, you know, who knows? Could have been. Paul Stein does stand out because it was a single man versus a couple. Wasn't a lover's lane, obviously. It was it was in the city of San Francisco in the Presidio. Um, you know, I lean against that for Stein because just from what I know about him, and I was fortunate enough to talk to someone on the phone a long time that knew Paul Stein well and just said he was what you saw. He was just the sweetest man you ever knew. Uh, painfully shy. Uh, really, you know, funny, kind of a cut up, but, but, but at the same time, very shy, you know, just like even when he had to speak in front of a class, he was very nervous, just a really good, solid guy. There's never been anything that's come out on Paul Stein that would show otherwise. So if who would want to kill Paul Stein, uh, is my question. I mean, and as far as Darlene Farron, like I said, uh, I think, you know, with, with, with all the men that she did date, she probably had some knowledge of something going down. So uh, I'm not saying she was. I'm really not. It's just if I had to gamble on this and you told me, hey, one of these four canonical Zodiac crimes, one of these people are a targeted murder, I'm going to go towards, uh, I'm unfortunately going to go towards her because of the network she was in and the people she knew just for that. Not a jealous thing, but maybe just for things that she knew. But like I said, none of these four could have been a, a targeted murder and they could have all been random. I'm just saying, if there was one, I lean towards Darlene Farron and not Paul Stein. But I agree with you. Paul Stein does stand out versus the other crimes. Okay, yeah, those are great questions. That's why I wanted to answer them here instead of just typing a bunch of stuff into the comment section because it's so long and that, you know, the answers would be so long. And then getting into the next part of Mark's question is, uh, you know, I kind of answered it before with the whole uh, Ralph Spinelli thing. And if you go watch, his name was Arthur Allen. I agree with... uh, with George Bauer, where he didn't think that, that Arthur Lee Allen would have been dumb enough to trust a hood like Ralph Spinelli, who had mob connections. Uh, 
you know, there was some bad blood between Alan and Spinelli. That's the, the, the video starts off with Spinelli telling that story about dancing with the girl and uh, the boyfriend getting mad. And the boyfriend was not Arthur Lee Allen, but maybe Arthur Lee Allen was friends with the boyfriend. Who knows who that was? But Arthur Lee Allen goes over to Spinelli's house and the door explodes and some fight ensues. It's just really strange in that uh, documentary. His name was Arthur Lee Allen. He never clarified that story from Ralph Spinelli, but... Uh, there was a police report on that date that they said that incident happened. So absolutely, uh, Arthur Lee Allen was aware of Ralph Spinelli. So I don't. I agree with George Bauer. Arthur Lee Allen would not have been dumb enough uh, to to trust Ralph Spinelli, and because you know uh, Allen knew what kind of guy Spinelli was, you couldn't trust him as far as you could throw him. So why would Allen want to go offer him services if he's going to be the Zodiac and do contract murders to Ralph Spinelli? It makes no sense whatsoever. So no, I don't. I don't think that's what happened at all. And on the screen is, of course, is a photo of uh, Ralph Spinelli holding up a book that he wrote called Prison as Punishment because he had done a lot of time in prison. And, and uh, for most accounts, Ralph Spinelli turned his life around. Uh, he went back. Got, I think he got a Ph.D. Um, you know, just did a lot of good things. It's just unfortunate that he didn't come clean before his death. He was dying of cancer. You can tell in this photo how skinny he is. It's because he's dying of cancer. Uh, he got to fulfill a lot of things. I think he, he met Jack Nicholas. You know, he was really into golf, so it was a big deal for him to get to meet uh, one of his idols in Jack Nicholas. And I'm glad he got to do that. But I really wish Ralph Spinelli came clean about the whole Arthur Lee Allen deal before he passed away, because I, I honestly don't think he was being honest about it. And then to answer the last part of Mark's question, he poses that, you know, maybe it was uh, Cheney and Arthur Lee Allen just doing the letters, just taunting the cops. And uh, they didn't, you know, uh, they wouldn't be the ones that did the murders, but they're the ones doing the correspondence. Uh, and that's interesting. He said, you know, maybe that's what happened because uh, Cheney and Allen were both tested against the DNA that they have and they both came back negative. Now, you know that DNA came from the outside of a stamp. It was one of the, uh, from one of the Zodiac letters sent to the San Francisco Chronicle uh, after the Paul Stein murder. And it was later determined that that sample that they had, first of all, it's very weak. It's four, four, out, of nine marker, uh, four out of nine marker DNA sample. It's very weak. came from the outside of the stamp. It was uh, the profile of a male, and the police thought they could rule out suspects based on that. And one of them was definitely Arthur Lee Allen, who was tested after he died. They took a sample of Arthur Lee Allen's brain against that sample, and, of course, he came back negative. Now, as far as Don Cheney goes, uh, you know, I, I've always just taken that as fact that he was also tested against that because I don't know why he w wouldn't have been. And But I've never seen an actual police report stating that, uh, that he was. But And he, if you go back to his name was Arthur Lee Allen, they asked George Bauer at that point blank, was, was Cheney's DNA tested? And I think his comment was, he doesn't think so. So it is odd to me that the guy that was heading up the case at that point in time uh, didn't know conclusively if Don Cheney was tested against that DNA. But, uh, it, you know, most people, I, a lot of people, I don't want to say most, but a, a good amount of people don't believe they have the Zodiac DNA. They really don't. Of course, we know Vallejo PD sent in a bunch of uh, letters a, a long time ago, like three years now, to try to get DNA off of uh, the covers or the stamps. And nothing's ever been mentioned since, and that was three years ago. Uh, as far as uh, Bowert saying that the, the handwriting wasn't a close match, well, handwriting's subjective, but I'll just offer up what you're looking at the screen right now in terms of at least a Don Cheney Zodiac match. Of course, that's Don on the right on graph paper and Zodiac on the left. I mean, uh, it's subjective, but that's pretty interesting. Here's some more. Of course, uh, the one on the right is Cheney, and that's um, H flipped upside down that looks like part of the M on map, but there's several. I mean, when you talk about Zodiac suspects, handwriting samples, uh, Cheney, in this, only, unfortunately, one sample we have, is it always comes up at the top of the discussion. Uh, like, well, there's one on Reddit I mentioned the other day where they said that Cheney and Hal Snook looked the closest to them. You know, there's a couple of uh, letters from uh, Ted Kaczynski that look really similar. I think some of Richard Gajkowski's handwriting looks pretty similar to the Zodiac. But uh, Cheney's always in the mix, so that's just I'm just going to offer that up there. And then when you talk about the fingerprints, uh, of course, we know that in the Zodiac case of the four canonical crimes, none of the f fingerprints that they retrieve from any of the uh, attack sites match each other. They're all partials and... The fingerprints from the payphone in Napa don't match the ones that they got from Paul Stein's cab from the Presidio attack. So take that in mind. None of the fingerprints that they have match each other, yet they still believe this is one killer and um, doing these four crimes. 
that I will say I'm not one of these people that try to dispute that any of the partials from the cab or the payphone or anywhere else for that matter in Zodiac are not Zodiac. I just, uh, you know, I don't have answers for it. If they are or not, they might not be, they could be, I, I don't know. Uh, that's the thing with this case. There's never hardly anything totally definitive, even pointing towards, uh, did they, you know, where is the evidence of these fingerprints being done by Cheney or anyone for that matter? Uh, you know, you just assume they did it and I go with those assumptions, but you know, I always want to go back and point to what we do know. And then, uh, the questions by Mark bring up this other topic of putting the Zodiac killer actual attacks and murders versus the actual letter writer and the person sending out the correspondence well we know that the debut of zodiac letter came out in early august of 1969 where he says this is the zodiac speaking that's the first time you hear the the name zodiac and with that letter also comes the cross circle logo that you see here on the figure that was described by brian hartnell at the lake berryessa attack that happened on september 27th 1969 so what I'm saying is that would beg the question, what came first, the, the letter, if, if it is two separate entities, uh, the killer separate from the letter writers or writer. Uh, so it looks like in this case, the letter writer was the first person to say the word Zodiac or write the word Zodiac and draw the cross circle logo. The first account we have of the actual attacker uh, doing any of this is the figure from Lake Berryessa wearing that cross circle logo that was described by Brian Hartnell. As of course, uh, Mike Mujot survives Blue Rock Springs. He never said that uh, when he was attacked, there was, you know, he never recalled. Of course, he had a flashlight in his face, but he did not recall anyone wearing an outfit like that. He remembered seeing the Zodiac's hair. Uh, no cross-circled uh, logo outfit like Barry S. Uh, he never said that the, the guy that shot him said the word Zodiac. And, of course, at Lake Barry S., uh, when the attacker approached Brian and Cecilia, he just said, I need your car keys and your money. He never said, I am Zodiac, which leads more to believe that it meant something to the attacker, that outfit, because uh, if he was wanting to just strike fear in them, why wouldn't he say, I am Zodiac, I'm going to kill you both, blah, 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 some ceremonial bullshit. No, he didn't. He just said, I want your money and your car keys. I'm going to get you tied up. Uh, but he yet was wearing that outfit with the cross circle logo, backed up by the one on the car door. So it looks like uh, there's just too many things that point to there being uh, the same people or person doing the murders and writing the correspondence. It's just the police felt that at the time, and most people over time seem to agree with that. This is not, uh, they don't seem to be separate. There's just too many things connecting them. And of course, of us, as I've said before, the biggest thing that connects the correspondence with the actual attacks would be the Zodiac sending in pieces of Paul Stein's bloody shirt that he took from him after he killed Paul Stein at the Presidio in October of 69. Of course, one one of the pieces of signed shirts comes in with a letter that has you know the typical personified Zodiac killer handwriting with the with the hard slanted D's and everything else and the the creepy verbiage and then uh, also one goes to uh, there's three pieces of correspondence that have a piece of signed shirt and one of them also being the letter sent to attorney Melvin Belli which had different handwriting uh, but it still had this you know a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt that was confirmed so. Uh, there's just too much going on there uh, to to connect the, the letter writers or the writer with the attacker. And um, so if it's not, it, like I said, going back to Lake Berryessa, that would have had to have been a copycat. Uh, you know, they, they you would have to have been a copycat. So if the letter writers are wanting to get in on just uh, claiming Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs, and they said, well, this guy's now calling himself the Zodiac. He's using this creepy logo. Let's go commit a murder, and then we can tie it to these other two crimes now. And then we'll do it by having this this uh, crazy, crazy outfit. But that's just, it's just too far of a stretch. Totally violates Occam's razor to do that. And if it's a copycat, you're using a knife versus a gun. And then again, you were planning to kill these two people. So why were the outfit at all? Uh, if, if you're planning for these people to die, why are you wearing the outfit? Cause if Brian Hartnell dies, you never know about the cross circle logo there. So it's too much of a stretch to, uh, to try to separate the attacker and the letters. It's just really difficult. And then I'll end of course with this, uh, 
newspaper clipping up here. It says, knife killer could strike again, declares Napa County officer. So this is already after the uh, debut of Zodiac Letter came out in August of 69. Of course, this happens in September 27th of 69. So a decent amount of time after. And here they're not already calling him, they're not calling him Zodiac. It says knife killer. Uh, so they haven't even put this together at, at the Napa register. So it's just more proof that this is all one and the same. And, uh, you know, I'm open to other things going on here because there are a lot of weird anomalies. But uh, I just, of course, I agree that this, this is uh, a, a duo doing the letters and the crimes, or at least a duo doing the letters and one person, you know, actually following through on the actual crimes themselves. So. Uh, it's just one of those things to think about. That was a great question, by the way. That's why I took so long to answer it. But thanks for uh, sending that in, Mark. And thanks again for everybody listening. I'll start doing some live stuff again soon. Thanks.